That sounds the safest bet. So for the final exam, obviously it covers chapter three or exam three, but it also covers everything else we've talked about. So is there a particular topic we want? If not, I'm gonna go back to limits. Limits. Twenty okay, final exam. Let me just write it down. Final exam. Not to be confused with exam three, because I had one student already say, I have to show my work, it's multiple choice. No, that's final exam. Final exam, 25 multiple choice. Uh, no show your work. No partial credit. Covers everything in course. Uh, section 5.6, area between two curves is supposed to be on there for sure because we did put that on exam three, okay? It take, you have two hours to complete it. One shot, there is a practice exam. Right now, the practice exam, last time I looked, they only had one try on it, on the practice. And it was a timed two hour exam. So as of right now, you only get one shot. So make sure you write down the problem and show your work. That way you can go back and review later. Because unless they change something, you only have one time to practice. Okay, any more questions about the general? Concept? No? All right, so um, we can do extreme values. We can do, um, well, I don't think derivative and integral we need to do because those are fresh. I think it's the limits that we need to focus on. What do y'all think? Yeah? All right, so there were a couple major topics and limits that we're going to focus on here then. For example, if I ask you to find the limit as x approaches 2 of x squared minus 4 over x minus 2. When you have a limit problem, what's the first thing you should try? Plug it in. All right, and y'all online, feel free to chime in. I have the chat box up and the speakers on, so... If you plug in in this problem, what's going to happen? The Not just the denominator. The, the top as well. Whenever the top and the bottom were both zero, that told us we need to do something in particular. Does anybody remember what that was? <clears throat> zero over zero was usually an indicator that we needed to apply some algebra. So simplifying is the idea. How would you simplify this one? Factor, good. So we have x plus 2, we have x minus 2 over x minus 2. Why is that helpful? Can cancel out, yep. We can cancel top and bottom. So now we're just taking the limit as x approaches 2 of x plus 2. Now just as a review here, what does it mean when you can cancel it from the top and the bottom? We have a hole. Does a hole affect a limit? If you have a line, you have a hole, you have a line. Does that hole affect the value of the limit there? No, the limit is the hole. So by canceling out the hole, we've now filled it in so we can actually find that point. So how do we find the limit? Plug it in, plug it in. So x is approaching 2, so 2 plus 2, which is? Questions? All right, let's make it a little bit more interesting. What if I ask you to find the limit as, hmm, I can make it up, but 
kind of scared to make it up. X goes to infinity <clears throat> for 3x to the 6th minus 5x squared over um, hmm, 7x to the 8th minus 5x to the 4th plus 6. There we go. That looks like fun. <clears throat> so what would we do in this case? Okay, now, do you have to show your work? No, because this is a multiple choice. Who cares about your work test? It's right or wrong. Use your time wisely. So in this case, we talked in class about how you have to multiply top and bottom by 1 over x to the 8, 1 over x to the 8. But you don't have to do that here. You can use a shortcut because I can't see what you're doing. The shortcut was this. When x is going to infinity and you have a uh, rational function, focus on the leading terms, the highest power of x on top, the highest power of x on the bottom. If the top degree is less than the bottom degree, which is this case, you're actually finding your horizontal asymptote because you're going to infinity. By the way, plus or minus doesn't matter. You end up going to the same place. And where was it here? Mm -hmm. Yeah, sorry, I had to process. And then if the top equals the bottom power, the coefficients in front. Yep, so in this case, if it had been x to the 8 over x to the 8, it would be 3 over 7. So I write as y equals a over b. And if the top is greater than the bottom, no horizontal asymptote, the limit actually approaches plus or minus infinity. Okay. That, those aren't usually our questions. We usually do the other two, so. How's that? We have my notes, seeing what else we need to talk about. Um, those are the main concepts. Can't open the practice exam and do it with you because you're right now we're only allowed to do it once, so that wouldn't be fair. Uh, okay, so here's another topic that might uh, help you. So we've talked about how to find local max and local min, and that's our focus. But remember, there's also the absolute max and absolute min. So in this case, we usually have a function f of x. So let's just make up a function. Um, x squared plus 5. And then this function right here, you could find an absolute max or an absolute min if one exists. You would have to use your first derivative sign chart. But most of the time when we talk about absolute max and min, we usually give you an interval over which to consider. For example, if I ask you just to focus on x values between negative 3 and 7. Let's try this problem. How would you find the absolute max and absolute min here? So you find the derivative. It's like equals zero. Good. So first of all, you do the derivative, which is what? 2x. We set that equal to zero. This is called something special. What are we looking for here? The critical points. This is also what we did for local max and local min. The difference is we don't just look at critical points here. So this says x equals 0 is our critical point. Where else could our, our absolute max and absolute min lie? Not just at critical points here. You also need to consider x equals negative 3 and 7, the end points. This was actually a theorem we had. The theorem said if you have a continuous function, between in a closed interval, which we're including negative three and including positive seven, closed interval, you have to have an absolute max and an absolute min. So how do we discover of these three points, which ones are absolute max and which ones are absolute min? Can 
How do you figure out which ones are absolute max and absolute min? <coughs> Go to your original function, your f, plug in your critical point, plug in your endpoints, each one, and get your values. So if we plug in 0 to x squared plus 5, we get 5. Negative 3 squared would be 9 plus 5 is 14. And then 49 plus 5, 54. How do these give us our absolute max and absolute min? Good. Take the biggest as your max and the lowest as your min. Questions? So that would be absolute max and absolute min. The negative three is an endpoint, so that is um, a local max because it's a parabola going up to that point, um, but it's not an absolute max because the other one, 54, was higher. So if you want to draw a picture of this, this was a parabola shifted up. We only had part of it. So we found our minimum here, an absolute min. And our absolute max was this endpoint. Okay. Another concept we talked about a lot was increasing and decreasing. So you may remember how we discovered where a function was increasing versus decreasing. Y'all online aren't allowed to be silent the whole time. You have to help. <laughs> okay, find the derivative. And find the critical points. Good. So we need our critical points, just like last time. But this time, we don't necessarily have endpoints. All right, so let's think of a good problem here. So let's say f of x equals... 1 over x plus 2. How do we find the critical points? Are you taking the derivative as is? Do you want to do the quotient rule, or can you do a trick, so to speak? All right, so bring the denominator. Whoops, that's not the derivative. So I'm doing algebra here. Bring the denominator up, and then you can just do the power chain rule. So bring the bottom up, negative one power. So now, what is the derivative of that function? And the derivative of the inside, one doesn't matter. So if we want to rewrite this, we can bring the x plus two downstairs with a two exponent, a negative, and that would leave a one on top. How do we find the critical points? Zero or undefined. So I chose a fraction on purpose. A fraction is zero when what happens? When the numerator is zero. A fraction is undefined when the denominator is zero. This only works though if you got rid of your negative exponent. You simplified, you have one fraction. Is the top ever zero here? Top is always going to be what number? One or negative one if you want to put the negative up there. It will never ever be zero. So we don't need to worry about that case. This is a, one of those weird times where zero never happens. Undefined, however, happens when what happens? <clears throat> when is the bottom going to be zero? Negative two. So uh, negative two is going to be what for us? Critical point. Now, we're trying to determine increasing and decreasing. How did we do that in the past? Yep, this is the first derivative sign chart. That's how I do it. Some of y'all have a different way. As long as it works, I am good with it. All right, so number line, critical point. We only have one in this case. 
How does the sign chart work? What do we need to do? All right, pick a number to the left and to the right. So what's to the left of negative two? Who's to the right? Two. Yeah, he's our friend. <clears throat> now, when you're testing for a first derivative sign chart, you want the first derivative sign. So who do you plug these into? First derivative. I'm gonna copy it down because I wrote all over it. Actually, what are your first derivative? Is there anything interesting happening here? It's a negative sign in front. Why is it always negative? The bottom is always positive. And then you have a negative on it. So this is always negative as a whole. Always negative. So do I even need to test? No, this is negative and this is negative because the first row is always negative, which means what? On the first row of the sign chart, the signs are telling you what information? Decreasing. decreasing and decreasing for negative. How can you have a function that decreases to a critical point and then decreases further? What is this critical point in this problem? If you go into my lab and you type in the critical point was at negative two, is it going to be happy with you? Talk about this. Why not? Go back to the original function. She's over here. What's happening at negative two? Undefined. What? Undefined. Undefined. So what's happening? It's a whole if you can cancel it out. Jump. It is a jump, kind of very, very large jump. Uh-oh. Okay, apparently we need to review that topic. So if your denominator equals zero and you cannot reduce, you have a vertical asymptote. So there is a vertical asymptote at this point here. We already talked about how to find a horizontal asymptote. So if we do that, we could actually graph this. Where's the horizontal asymptote for this function? The degree of the top is less than the degree of the bottom, so y equals zero. With that information, we actually have everything we need to draw this, I believe. So we have a horizontal asymptote at y equals zero. We have a vertical asymptote at our critical point, negative two. And then our curve is decreasing and decreasing again. Have to approach your asymptote. So you can be here or here on the left. Which one's decreasing? The bottom. bottom one. So it's the one we're going to keep is the bottom one. Well, I ran into my asymptote. Don't cross your vertical. All right. On the right hand side, we have to approach our asymptote. So it could be one of these two. We're supposed to be decreasing. Which one is decreasing? Yeah. Which one? The one on top, yeah. So that's the one we'll keep. Now, do we cross the horizontal asymptote? That's a question we have to ask. If we cross the horizontal asymptote, then we have to come down and we have to come back to the horizontal asymptote, which we've talked about. That means you have to change direction. You have to go back up. Are we supposed to be increasing over here? Do we have another local min over here? No, we had none of those things. So we cannot cross the horizontal. You can also check for a point. Take your function, set it equal to your horizontal asymptote. One over x plus two will never equal zero. Therefore, we cannot cross the horizontal asymptote. Okay, should we continue on to concavity here? Y'all remember how to do concavity? Second derivative. I need my first derivative. What was it? 
negative one over x plus two squared. All right, so concavity We actually don't even need it to graph this picture, but we can use it to check our work. So how do we find the concavity? You said second derivative. In this format, or should we bring it back up? It's easier if we bring the denominator back up to take the derivative. So concavity comes from the second derivative. What would be the derivative of this function? The derivative of the inside is one, so we don't need to worry about the chain rule. Well, we do need to worry about the chain rule, but it doesn't do any, <clears throat> make any changes. If we rewrite that by bringing the denominator back down, how do we figure out concavity here? Potential inflection points. How do we find potential inflection points? Zero or undefined. When is this function going to equal zero? Mm -mm. Never equals zero. Remember, equals zero is when the top equals zero. Undefined is when the bottom equals zero. The top is a two. The two will never turn into a zero. The bottom, however, zeroes out, so the function becomes, or the second derivative becomes undefined when x equals what? Which happens to also be something we've already seen before. What happens at negative two in this problem? Vertical asymptote. So, second derivative sign chart to uh, show our work for finding concavity. So our critical point is again at negative two. I'm gonna mark this as a vertical asymptote. So will we have an inflection point? Yes, you do. It's a vertical asymptote. Can you have a point on a vertical asymptote? No, but you can change concavity around a vertical asymptote. So just be cautious. All right, so how do we check for concavity? I guess we can use the same numbers as last time. Test negative three and zero. But who do we plug in, plug them into this time? Second derivative. So the second derivative, uh, if I copy it down, was two over x plus two cubed. Can we use the trick we used last time? Is this always positive or always negative? Not in this case, because it's a cube power. So we actually have to plug it in. So if we plug in negative three, all I need is the sign. What sign do we get? Negative. If we plug in zero, what sign do we get? Positive. So put those on your picture. Negative, positive. What do these signs translate to mean? Concave down. Good. Very good. that match the picture we drew in the last um, part. So concave down and concave up. Let's go back and look at our picture. This should be concave down. Is it? It's part of a frown. And the other one should be concave up. Is it? It's part of a cup. Question? Good. All right, another topic is finding the average of a function. So if you take a function f of x equals x squared plus, let me do plus five again. And you want to know what the average value of that function is on a particular interval. So we can look from zero to Why not? How would you find the average value of this function? Good. So 
1 over b minus a times the integral from a to b of your function. So in our problem, what are a and b? Yep, so a is 0, b is 8. So 1 over 8 minus 0, integral from 0 to 8, x squared plus 5 dx. So 1 over 8 times, what's the antiderivative here? Good. And you don't need plus c because this is a definite integral. Who do we evaluate at first? Eight. Good. Oh boy. I chose a big number. I shouldn't have. Eight cubed. Eight times eight is 64. Times eight again. I have no idea. Five twelve over three plus eight times five is forty. Minus what happens when we plug in zero? Sure. At least I was spread on that one. All right, work it out. So forty is over one. Get a common denominator. So multiply by three. One twenty over three. So that would be 632 over 3 times 1 over 8, which could reduce, and I'll leave that up to y'all. Whoops. So this is the average value of f over the interval from 0 to 8. What else? Do y'all have any topics you want? Is there going to be a question on the, I forgot what it's called, the, the person error thing? Find the person of error? No. Is that really on yeah, no percent error question. What if I give you an acceleration of 10? I give you an initial velocity of 5, you get negative 5, and an initial position of negative 15. Can you find the position function? Remember which one is the position function? S function is your position function, so S of T. How do we find S of T if we only know these three values? Very close. I think you forgot to divide by two yep. in the first term. Okay. Uh, so I think you're using physics. Did you actually do the calculus or did you use physics? You use physics, yeah. All right, so here's the tricky part. <clears throat> the V and the S are the values at one particular time, T0. What about A? Does it have a particular time? This is at any time t. A is always going to be 10, which means this is actually the full function A of t. So if you want to go back, remember there's a relationship. If you, here, let's review that real quick. The position function, the velocity function, the acceleration function. What's the relationship between all three? 
The derivative of each other. Velocity is the derivative of who? Position. Acceleration is the derivative of velocity. Or the second derivative of position. They're giving us A. How do we get back to S? We take the antiderivative. So the velocity is the first one we go to because the antiderivative of acceleration is the velocity. So integrate A of T, dt. And then that would be integral of 10 dt. What's the antiderivative of 10? 10 t plus c. Good. But they told us that v of 0 is equal to negative 5. If this is your v function, what does that mean? Good. Plug in your 0. So 10 times 0 plus c is equal to the negative 5. Well, 10 times 0 is gone. That tells you your c. So v is 10t minus 5. But that's not what we want. We're going to get all the way back to position. So how do we get from velocity back to position? One more antiderivative. So s of t is the antiderivative of velocity. And since we know our velocity, we can plug it in. Antiderivative of 10t minus 5 dt. What's the antiderivative? So there's your position function, but what are we missing? The c. Now, what did I make the initial condition? s of 0 is negative 15. So if we plug 0 in, we get 0 minus 0 plus c, and we know this has to be negative 15. So c is negative 15. We plug that in, and there is your position function. How's that? Whoops, wrong button. Do you remember how to find a tangent line? If, let's see, if you have a function f of x equals, oh, what should we practice? Square root, I'm probably going to regret whatever I'm about to write, of, hmm, x to the third minus 8. Hopefully that's not too terrible. Uh, let's find the tangent line to our function at x equals 2. I'm going to use my smarts right here and pick a reasonable value. What are we going to do? Okay, so y equals f of 2, so cube root of 2 cubed minus 8, 8 minus 8, or 0. So there's the y value and the x value. How do you find a line? What else do you need? Slope. The slope of the tangent line is found by what? What? Derivative. So we need the derivative. And then we're going to evaluate it where? At our x value, which is 2. Mm -hmm. So let's find the derivative. How do we do that? Chain rule. I'm going to rewrite it first, make sure everybody's understanding. The square root, we don't have a rule for. But the power of 1 half is the same as the square root. Now we have a rule. All right, so power rule. One half comes down, what happens to the inside? It stays the same. What's your new power? We have one half. Are we done? Times the derivative of the inside. 3x squared. We need to evaluate this at uh, 2. So let's clean it up and then we'll plug it in. So fraction. Let's see, we have the 1 half, so 2 goes on the bottom, 3x squared is on top, and then this disaster here, if we bring it downstairs, it's actually going to be a square root, or you can leave the 1 half power, 
of the x cubed minus 8. If we plug in 2, <laughs> I chose a bad one. What happens? It's undefined. No, there's a tangent line. If your slope of your tangent line is undefined, this is one of those tricky ones. I always have to write it down. So rise over run, that means your run is zero <clears throat> if it's undefined. So get from point to point, you rise, so it's going to be a vertical line, not a horizontal line. Undefined slope means, what did I just say? Vertical line. Y equals our Y value to zero. Which if you think about a basic square root, looks like so. This is not quite a basic, because it's got the cube in it, but it would have a vertical tangent line here. <clears throat> That's not the right graph, because I didn't deal with the cube root or the negative eight, but roughly speaking, why did I write y equals zero? Vertical line's x equals zero. Somebody needs to catch me on that. Vertical line, x equals zero. All right, anybody online have any suggestions? Anybody in the classroom have any suggestions? We need to do any U sub practice. Um, area between curve, no, area, area between curves is on this test because that's 5.6. Um, definitely on the final. Area under a curve could be on exam three. Do we need to practice those at all? U sub. Love the sound effects. Is that a hand being raised? Because I can't see anything when I'm sharing my screen. <laughs> nope. I'm running out, of, I'm out of ideas. I did limits. Did I miss anything in limits? I don't think so. Optimization is on exam three and it could be on the final. <laughs> do we want to do an optimization? If I want. Did I open up my lab yet? Mm, nope. <clears throat> That's probably the last problem we do unless y'all tell me you have something else. Practice for exam three. Let's go in there and find an optimization. I did a couple of my class earlier. All right, so we have minimize the rectangle perimeter or farmland bounded by a river, so a rectangle with a river on one side, or we have a right circular cylindrical can. Do you like any of those? Yeah, two rectangles or a cylindrical can. Somebody give me, tell me what they want. I'll let you choose. What? I'll let you choose. You'll let me choose. Anybody online want to tell me what to pick? Where'd my chat box go? Are y'all awake online? <laughs> I feel like I'm talking to just you four because there's no response. guys I cannot pick you have to pick farmland or cylinder farmland all right thank you there's no wrong answer here 
farmland is easier. Is that what you said? It's true. So you're just so the, the goal here is to get one down good so that we're we're, we're safe on at least one of them, right? Uh, all right. Organization is is challenging, but it's the same process every single time. So you have a rectangular plot of farmland, but there's a river on one side. <clears throat> um, on the other three sides, you have a single strand electric fence with 2,300 meters of wire at your disposal. What is the largest area you can enclose? What are its dimensions? So we're trying to find the largest area. Another interpretation of largest. Mathematically, what do we call that? Max. We want to maximize the area. So what do we need to figure out? If we want to maximize the area, we need what about the area? What do we need to know about the area in order to maximize it? Well, kind of. <clears throat> we have to take, we have to find a formula for area, which I think is what you're implying, and we need to take the derivative of it. All right, so on our graph, or on our picture, what do we need to label? I have no idea what the area is because I have no labels whatsoever. How long is this side? I don't know. So what do we call it? X. X. How long is this side? Y. Yeah, we don't know, so we call it Y. It's a rectangle, so we're assuming they're different. Granted, a square is technically also a rectangle, so they could be the same, but we'll find that out when we do the math. All right, so if the bottom is X, the right side is Y, how long is the top? It's a rectangle. X. Uh-huh. All right, so what's the area of this rectangle? That would be perimeter, 2X plus Y. What did you say? X times Y. There we go. But you were right. The perimeter is 2X plus Y. What else do we know about the perimeter? They told us how much wire we have. And if we're trying to maximize our area, we're going to use every single inch of that or every single centimeter of that wire. So that is our perimeter. We want to maximize the area. So we need to take the derivative of the area. That is a problem right now. Why is that an issue? It's not about not knowing x and y, it's that we have two variables. If you have to take the derivative of this, you have to use implicit. You're going to have product rule, you're going to have dx, d something, dy, d something. You know, what do we do? We want to simplify this. In optimization, find your formula and then try and figure out a way to make it easier. Good. Use your perimeter to solve for one of the variables and then plug it in. So which one's easier to solve for here? Y. All right. So y equals 2300 minus 2x. Plug it in. So area equals x times 2300 minus 2x. What did we say we need to do to area? Find the derivative. As is, we'd have to use what rule? Do we want to use product rule? What's our other option? Algebra. Distribute your x, and you don't have to use product rule. So 2300x minus 2x squared. What's the derivative? Good. We have the derivative. How do we find out the, um, the maximum area? Equal to zero. Solve for x. I'm going to bring the 23, no, I'm going to leave the 2300. I'm going to bring the 4x around. That way everything's positive. Divide by the 4. And that's x. What is that value? 575. But is that what it asked us to find? 
Go back and look. What is the largest area you can enclose and what are its dimensions? So X is what information? One dimension. How do we find the other dimension and how do we find area? Plug it in. To what? Param yeah, you said right. Perimeter formula. Uh, 2300 minus 2X. So 2300 minus 2 times 575. <clears throat> Calculator. 1150. We're almost done. Did I get that right? <laughs> How do you find the area? Get x times y, so 575 times 1150, and I cannot do that in my head. And this would be meters squared. A lot of area. Yeah, nice big passion here. All right, I have two minutes left. Uh, exam three closes tomorrow night. You have to show your work for exam three, upload it to Canvas. Um, final exam, there is a practice, please use it. I'll send out an update if they tell me they're gonna change how many times y'all can take it, but as of right now, it's one shot practice exam. So please use that appropriately. Oh, I've got attendance. Uh, I'll do that before y'all disappear. All right. I still haven't learned all y'all's names. It's so hard when I don't see y'all four times a week. All right, help me. It's either Gianna or Sierra. Which one? Gianna. Gianna. All right, got that one. And I think you were Lynn. Yeah. Hey, I'm not as bad as I thought. Mm. I won't, no. I'm going to get it wrong, so go ahead and tell me. Surprise. What? Surprise. Surprise you? Oh, crud. I say Jordan. Walter. Where's Walter? Oh, there you are. All right. Um, I won't say Zachary, but hey! Okay, and everybody online, I can cheat because all your names are up there. I'm sorry. Hey, quickly, the, yeah. The practice exam for tomorrow is due at 10 a.m. In a way, I'm thinking I'm doing it today, but like the practice exam is due at oh, 10 a.m. They did that. I didn't do that. I'll fix it. Yeah, thanks. Thank you for letting me know. Yes. I mean, I'm thinking I'm doing it today, but just in case that's okay. Yeah. Jackson, what class are you in? Oh, there you are. Found you. Jordan, got you, Joseph. All right, everybody online, I got y'all. Thank you. If y'all need anything, let me know. Have a wonderful Thanksgiving. <laughs>